Lewis's Medical Surgical Nursing, 11th edition, Chapter 61, Assessment, Musculoskeletal System. The musculoskeletal system is composed of voluntary muscle and six types of connective tissue, bone, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, fascia, and bursae. The purpose of the musculoskeletal system is to protect body organs, provide support and stability for the body, store minerals, and allow coordinated movement. The chapter reviews the structure and function of the musculoskeletal system to facilitate nursing assessment and evaluation of the assessment findings. Structures and functions of musculoskeletal system. Bone function. The main functions of bone are support, protection of internal organs, voluntary movement, blood cell production, and mineral storage. Bones provide the supporting framework that keeps the body from collapsing. It allows the body to bear weight. Bones protect underlying vital organs and tissues. For example, the skull encloses the brain and vertebrae surround the spinal cord. The rib cage protects the lungs and heart. Bones serve as a point of attachment for muscles and ligaments. Muscles are connected to bones by tendons. Bones act as a lever for muscles. Movement occurs because of muscle contractions applied to these levers. Ligaments provide stability to joints. Bone marrow contains hematopoietic tissue responsible for making red and white blood cells. Bones serve as a storage site for inorganic minerals, including calcium and phosphorus. Bone is a dynamic tissue that continuously changes form and composition. Contains both organic material, collagen, and inorganic material, calcium, phosphate. The internal and external growth and remodeling of bone are ongoing processes. Microscopic structure. Bone is classified according to structure as cortical, compact, and dense, or cancellous, spongy. In cortical bone, cylindrical structural units called osteons haversian systems fit closely together to create a dense bone structure. Within the systems, the haversian canals run parallel to the bone's long axis. They contain the blood vessels that travel to the bone's interior from the periosteum. Surrounding each osteon are concentric rings known as lamellae, which indicate mature bone. Smaller canals, canaliculi, extend from the haversian canals to the lacunae, where mature bone cells are embedded. Cancellous bone has a different structure than cortical bone. The lamellae are not arranged in concentric rings. Instead, they occur along the lines of maximum stress placed on the bone. Cancellous bone is filled with red or yellow marrow. Blood reaches the bone cells by passing through spaces in the marrow. The three types of bone cells are osteoblasts, osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Osteoblasts synthesize organic bone matrix, collagen, and are the basic bone forming cells. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. Osteoclasts take part in bone remodeling by helping the breakdown of bone tissue. Bone remodeling is the removal of old bone by osteoclasts, resorption, and the deposit of new bone by osteoblasts, ossification. The inner layer of bone is made mostly of osteoblasts with a few osteoclasts. Gross structure. The anatomic structure of bone is best represented by a typical long bone, such as the tibia. Each long bone consists of epiphyses, diaphyses, and metaphyses. The epiphyses, a widened area at each end of a long bone, is made mostly of cancellous bone. The wide epiphyses allows greater weight distribution and provides stability for the joint. The epiphyses is a primary location of muscle attachment. Articular cartilage covers the ends of the epiphyses. It provides a smooth, low-friction surface for joint movement. 
The diaphysis is the main shaft of the long bone. It provides structural support and is composed of cortical bone. The tubular structure of the diaphysis allows it to withstand bending and twisting forces more easily. The metaphysis is the flared area between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Like the epiphysis, it is composed of cancellous bone. The epiphyseal plate, physis or growth plate, is the cartilaginous area between the epiphyses and metaphyses. In skeletally immature children who still have open growth plates, the epiphyseal plate actively makes chondrocytes that become mature bone. Division of the chondrocytes causes longitudinal bone growth in children. Injury to the epiphyseal plate in a growing child can cause the formation of new bone to stop at the growth plate. This leads to a shorter extremity and may contribute to significant functional problems. In the adult, the metaphyses and epiphyses become joined when chondrocyte formation at the growth plate stops and bone formation is complete. The periosteum is composed of fibrous connective tissue that covers the bone. Tiny blood vessels penetrate the periosteum to bring nutrition to underlying bone. Musculotendinous fibers attach to the outer layer of the periosteum. Collagen bundles attach the inner layer of the periosteum to the bone. There is no periosteum on the articular surfaces of long bones. These bone ends are covered by articular cartilage. The medullary marrow cavity in the center of the diaphyses contains either red or yellow bone marrow. In adults, red marrow is found mainly in the flat bones, such as the pelvis, skull, sternum, cranium, ribs, vertebrae, and scapulae, and cancellous spongy bone at the epiphyseal ends of long bones, such as the femur and humerus. Red bone marrow is involved in blood cell production, hematopoiesis. In the adult, the medullary cavity of long bones contains yellow bone marrow, mainly adipose tissue. Yellow marrow is involved in hematopoiesis in times of great blood cell need. Types. The skeleton consists of 206 bones. They are classified according to shape as long, short, flat, or irregular. Long bones have a central shaft, diaphyses, and two widened ends, epiphyses. Examples include the femur, humerus, and tibia. Short bones are composed of cancellous bone covered by a thin layer of compact bone. Examples include the carpals in the hand and tarsals in the foot. Flat bones have two layers of compact bone separated by a layer of cancellous bone. Examples include the ribs, skull, scapula, and sternum. The spaces in the cancellous bone contain bone marrow. Irregular bones appear in a variety of shapes and sizes. Samples include the sacrum, mandible, and ear ossicles. Joints. A joint, or articulation, is a place where the ends of two bones are close and move in relation to each other. Joints are classified by the degree of movement that they allow. The most common joint is the freely movable diarthroidal synovial type. Each joint is enclosed in a capsule of fibrous connective tissue, which joins the two bones together to form a cavity. The capsule is lined by a synovial membrane, which secretes thick synovial fluid. The fluid lubricates the joint, reduces friction, and allows opposing surfaces to slide smoothly over each other. The end of each bone is covered with articular hyaline cartilage. Supporting structures, e.g. ligaments, tendons, reinforce the joint capsule. They provide limits and stability to joint movement. Cartilage. The three types of cartilage are 
hyaline, elastic, and fibrous. Hyaline cartilage is the most common. It has a moderate amount of collagen fibers. It is found in the trachea, bronchi, nose, epiphyseal plate, and articular surfaces of bones. Elastic cartilage, which has both collagen and elastic fibers, is more flexible than hyaline cartilage. It's found in the ear, epiglottis, and larynx. Fibrous cartilage, fibrocartilage, consists mostly of collagen fibers. It is a tough tissue that often functions as a shock absorber. Fibrous cartilage is found between the vertebral discs. It also forms a protective cushion between the bones of the pelvic girdle, knee, and shoulder. Cartilage in synovial joints serves as a support for soft tissue and provides the articular surface for joint movement. It connects underlying tissues. Because articular cartilage is avascular, it must receive nourishment by the diffusion of material from the synovial fluid. The lack of a direct blood supply contributes to the slow metabolism of cartilage cells and explains why healing and repair of cartilage tissues occurs slowly. Cartilage in the epiphyseal plate is also involved in the growth of long bones before physical maturity is reached. Muscle types. The three types of muscle tissue are cardiac, striated, involuntary, smooth, non-striated, involuntary, and skeletal, striated, voluntary muscle. Cardiac muscle is found only in the heart. Its spontaneous contractions pump blood through the circulatory system. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of hollow structures such as airways, arteries, GI tract, urinary bladder, and uterus. Smooth muscle contraction is controlled by neuronal and hormonal influences. Skeletal muscle, which requires neuronal stimulation for contraction, counts for about half of a human's body weight. It is the focus of the following discussion. Structure. The skeletal muscle is enclosed by the epimesium, a continuous layer of deep fascia. The epimesium helps muscles slide over nearby structures. Connective tissue surrounding and extending into the muscle can be subdivided into fiber bundles, Vesiculi. These bundles are covered by paramesium and an innermost connective tissue layer called the endomesium that surrounds each fiber. The structural unit of skeletal muscle is the muscle cell or muscle fiber. It is highly specialized for contraction. Skeletal muscle fibers are long multinucleated cylinders that contain many mitochondria to support their high metabolic activity. Muscle fibers are composed of myofibrils, which in turn are made up of protein contractile filaments. The sarcomere is the contractile unit of the myofibrils. Each sarcomere consists of myosin, thick filaments, and actin, thin filaments. The arrangements of the thin and thick filaments causes a characteristic banding of muscle seen under a microscope. Muscle contraction occurs as thick and thin filaments slide past each other, causing the sarcomeres to shorten. Contractions. Skeletal muscle contractions allow posture, maintenance, body movement, and facial expressions. Isometric contractions increase the tension within a muscle but do not produce movement. Isotonic contractions shorten a muscle to produce movement. Most contractions are a combination of tension generation, isometric, and shortening, isotonic. Repeated isometric and or isotonic contractions provide stress to stimulate muscle growth. Muscle atrophy, decrease in size, occurs with the absence of contractions that results from immobility or decreased neuronal stimulation. Increased muscular activity leads to hypertrophy, increase in size. Skeletal muscle fibers are divided into two groups based on the type of activity that they show. Slow twitch muscle fibers support prolonged muscle activity, such as marathon running. Because they also support the body against gravity, they help in posture maintenance. Fast twitch muscle fibers are used for rapid muscle contraction needed for activities such as blinking the eye, jumping, or sprinting. Fast twitch fibers tend to tire more quickly than slow twitch fibers. Neuromuscular junction. Skeletal muscle fibers require a nerve impulse to contract. A nerve fiber and the skeletal muscle fibers it stimulates are called a motor end plate. The junction between the axon of the nerve cell 
and the adjacent muscle is called the myoneural or neuromuscular junction. Presynaptic neurons release acetylcholine. It diffuses across the neuromuscular junction to bind with receptors on the motor end plate of the muscle. In response to the stimulation, the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases calcium ions into the cytoplasm. The presence of calcium triggers a contraction in the myofibrils. When calcium is low, tetany, involuntary contraction of the skeletal muscle, can occur. Energy source. The direct energy source for muscle fiber contractions is adenosine triphosphate, ATP. ATP is synthesized by cellular oxidative metabolism in the numerous mitochondria found close to the myofibrils. It is rapidly depleted through conversion to adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and must be rephosphorylated. Phosphocreatine provides a rapid source for the resynthesis of ATP, but it is in turn converted to creatine. Glycolysis can serve as a source of ATP when the O2 supply is inadequate for metabolic needs of the muscle tissue. In this process, one glucose molecule is broken down to two ATP molecules. Ligaments and tendons. Ligaments and tendons are composed of dense, fibrous connective tissue with bundles of closely packed collagen fibers arranged in the same plane for additional strength. Tendons attach muscle to bone as an extension of the muscle sheath that adheres to the periosteum. Ligaments connect bones to bones, e.g. tibia to femur at knee joint. They have a higher elastic content than tendons. Ligaments provide stability while allowing controlled movement at joints. Ligaments and tendons have a relatively poor blood supply. This can make tissue repair a slow process after injury. For example, the stretching or tearing of ligaments that occurs with a sprain may require a long time to mend. Fascia. Fascia refers to layers of connective tissue with intermeshed fibers that can withstand limited stretching. Superficial fascia lies right under the skin. Deep fascia is a dense fibrous tissue that surrounds muscle bundles, nerves, and blood vessels. It also encloses individual muscles, allowing them to act independently and to glide over each other during contraction. In addition, fascia provides strength to muscle tissues. Bursae. Bursae are small sacs of connective tissue lined with synovial membrane and containing viscous synovial fluid. They are found at bony prominences or joints to relieve pressure and decrease friction between moving parts. For example, bursae are found between the one patella and skin, prepatellar bursae, two, olecranon process of the elbow and skin, olecranon bursae, three, head of the humerus and acromion process of the scapula, subacromial bursae, and four, greater trochanter of the proximal femur and skin, trochanteric bursae. Bursitis is an inflammation of a bursa sac. The inflammation may be acute or chronic Gerontologic considerations, effects of aging on musculoskeletal system. Many functional problems experienced by the older adult are related to changes in the musculoskeletal system. Although some changes begin in early adulthood, obvious signs of musculoskeletal impairment may not appear until later adult years. Changes may affect the older adult's ability to complete self-care tasks and pursue other usual activities. Effects of musculoskeletal changes may range from mild discomfort and decreased ability to perform ADLs to severe chronic pain and immobility. The bone remodeling process changes in the aging adult. Increased bone resorption and decreased bone formation cause a loss of bone density. This contributes to the development of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Muscle mass and strength decrease. Almost 30% of muscle mass is lost by age 70. A loss of motor neurons can cause problems with skeletal muscle movement. Tendons and ligaments become less flexible, making movement more rigid. Perform a musculoskeletal assessment with an emphasis on exercise practices.
Obtain information on the type of exercise performed. Include frequency and warm-up activities. Determine the impact of age-related changes of the musculoskeletal system on functional status. Specifically ask about changes in self-care habits and ability to be independent in the home environment. Functional limitations that are accepted by the older adult as normal part of aging can often be addressed with appropriate preventative strategies. The risk for falls increases in the older adult due in part to loss of strength. Aging can also bring changes in the patient's balance, making the person unsteady. Proprioception, awareness of self in relation to the environment, may be altered. Identify any musculoskeletal changes that increase the patient's risk for falls. Discuss fall prevention strategies. Osteoarthritis is more likely to affect joints in the aging adult. Metabolic bone diseases involve the deterioration of bone tissue, osteoporosis, and destruction of cartilage, osteoarthritis. Carefully distinguish between expected changes and the effects of disease in the aging adult. Symptoms of disease can be treated in many cases, helping the older adult to return to a higher functional level. Assessment of musculoskeletal system. Subjective data. Important health information. Past health history. The most common manifestations of musculoskeletal impairment include pain, weakness, deformity, limitation of movement, stiffness, and joint crepitation, cracking sound. Ask the patient about changes in sensation or in the size of a muscle. Questions should focus on symptoms of arthritic and connective tissue diseases, e.g. gout, psoriatic arthritis, systemic lupus, osteomalacia, osteomyelitis, and fungal infection of bones or joints. Ask the patient about sources of a secondary bacterial infection, such as ears, nostrils, teeth, sinuses, lungs, or genitourinary tract. These infections can enter the bones, resulting in osteomyelitis or joint destruction. Get a detailed account of the course and treatment of any of these problems. Certain illnesses are known to affect the musculoskeletal system directly or indirectly. Ask the patient about medical problems such as tuberculosis, poliomyelitis, diabetes, parathyroid problems, hemophilia, rickets, soft tissue infection, and neuromuscular disability. Trauma to the musculoskeletal system is a common reason for seeking medical care. The patient who is a good historian can recount minor and major injuries of the musculoskeletal system. Record information chronologically and include mechanism and circumstances of the injury, e.g. twist, crush, stretch, methods and duration of treatment, current status related to the injury, need for assistive devices, interference with ADLs. Medications. Ask the patient about prescription and over-the-counter drugs, herbal products, and nutritional supplements. Get detailed information about each treatment, including its name, dose and frequency, length of time it was taken, reason for use, and any possible side effects. Ask about the use of skeletal muscle relaxants, opioids, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, corticosteroids, and calcium and vitamin D supplements. Review the use of drugs that can have detrimental effects on the musculoskeletal system. Some of these and their potential side effects include anti-seizure drugs, osteomalacia, phenothiazines, gait changes, corticosteroids, avascular necrosis, decreased bone and muscle mass, and potassium-depleting diuretics, muscle cramp, and weakness. Ask postmenopausal women about the use of hormone therapy, surgery, or other treatments. Ask about any hospitalizations related to a musculoskeletal problem. Document the reason for hospitalization, the date and duration, and the treatment, including ongoing rehabilitation. Record details of emergency treatment for musculoskeletal injuries. Get specific information about any surgical procedure, postoperative of course, and complications. Ask the patient about past total knee or total hip replacement. If the patient had a period of prolonged immobilization, consider the possible development of disuse, osteoporosis, and muscle atrophy. Functional health patterns. As for developing musculoskeletal problems can affect the patient's overall health. The use of functional health patterns helps organize assessment data. Table 61.2 outlines specific questions to ask in relation to functional health patterns. Health Perception Health Management Plan. Ask about the patient's health practices related to musculoskeletal system. 
This includes maintaining normal body weight, avoiding excessive stress on muscles and joints, and using proper body mechanics when lifting objects. Ask the patient about tetanus, pertussis, and polio immunizations. Safety practices can affect the patient's predisposition for certain injuries and illnesses. Ask the patient about safety practices related to the work environment, home life, recreation, and exercise. For example, if the patient is a computer programmer, ask about ergonomic adaptations in the office that decrease the risk for carpal tunnel syndrome or low back pain. Identifying problems in this area will direct your plan for patient teaching. Get a family history of a rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, ankylosing spondylitis, osteoarthritis, gout, osteoporosis, and scoliosis. The patient may have a genetic predisposition to these or other musculoskeletal disorders. Nutritional metabolic pattern. Pattern description of a typical day's diet gives clues to areas of nutritional concern that can affect the musculoskeletal system. Adequate intake of vitamin C and D, calcium and protein, essential for a healthy musculoskeletal system. Abnormal nutritional patterns can contribute to problems such as osteomalacia and osteoporosis. Maintaining normal weight is an important nutritional goal. <laughs> Obesity places added stress on weight-bearing joints such as the knees, hips, and spine. It increases the risk for cartilage deterioration and ligament instability. Elimination pattern. Question about the parent's mobility may reveal problems with ambulating to the toilet. Ask the patient if an assistive device such as an elevated toilet seat or a grab bar is needed to manage toileting. Increased mobility from a musculoskeletal problem can lead to constipation. Musculoskeletal problems can contribute to bowel or bladder incontinence when ambulation is a problem. Activity exercise pattern. Many musculoskeletal problems can affect the patient's activity exercise pattern. Get a detailed account of the type, duration, and frequency of exercise and recreational activities. Compare daily, weekend, and seasonal patterns because occasional exercise can be more of a problem than regular exercise. Ask the patient about clumsiness or limitations in movement pain, weakness, crepitus, or any changes in bones or joints that interferes with daily activities. Streams of activity related to occupation can affect the musculoskeletal system. For example, desk job can negatively affect muscle flexibility and strength. Jobs that require heavy lifting or pushing can lead to damage of joints and supporting structures. Specifically, ask the patient about work-related musculoskeletal injuries, including treatment and time lost from work. Sleep rest pattern. The discomfort caused by musculoskeletal problems can interfere with the patient's normal sleep pattern and lead to fatigue. Ask the patient about any changes in sleep patterns. If the patient describes poor sleep related to musculoskeletal problems, ask about the type of bedding and pillows used bedtime routine, sleeping partner, and sleeping positions. Cognitive perceptual pattern. Fully discuss any pain reported by the patient due to a musculoskeletal problem. To give a baseline for later reassessment, ask the patient to describe the intensity of the pain on a numeric scale from zero to 10. Reassessments over time help to determine the effectiveness of any treatment plan. Ask the patient about measures used to manage pain. Also ask about related problems such as joint swelling, muscle weakness, and any adjustments that help the problem. Self-perception, self-concept pattern. Many chronic musculoskeletal problems lead to deformities and a reduction in activities. This can have a serious negative impact on the patient's body image and sense of personal worth. Assess the patient's feelings about these changes and any effect on interactions with family and friends. Role relationship pattern. Impaired mobility and chronic pain from musculoskeletal problems can negatively affect the patient's ability to 
perform in roles of spouse, parent, or employee. The ability to pursue and maintain meaningful social and personal relationships also can be affected by musculoskeletal problems. Carefully ask the patient about role performance and relationships. If the patient lives alone, any musculoskeletal problem and rehabilitation may make it hard or impossible to continue, continue to do so. Assess how much help is available from family, friends, and other caregivers. Find out if other resources are needed, such as physical therapy and home health care. Sexuality, reproductive pattern. Ask women about their menstrual history. Episodes of premenopausal amenorrhea can contribute to the development of osteoporosis. The pain of musculoskeletal problems can affect the patient's ability to obtain sexual satisfaction. Explore this area in a sensitive and non-judgmental way. Help the patient feel comfortable discussing any sexual problems related to pain, movement, and positioning. More information on obtaining patient data in this area is discussed in Chapter 50. Coping Stress Tolerance Pattern Mobility limitations and pain are serious potential stressors that challenge the patient's coping resources. Recognize the potential for difficulty coping in the patient and family or significant other. Additional questions will help to determine if a musculoskeletal problem is causing difficulties in coping and adjusting. Value Belief Pattern Ask the patient about cultural or religious beliefs that may influence acceptance of treatment for the musculoskeletal problem. This may include recommendations for diet, exercise, medication, and lifestyle modifications. Objective data. Physical examination. The basic musculoskeletal physical examination involves inspection, palpation, neurovascular assessment, and range of motion, strength, and reflex testing. Other special tests can be used to assess for specific conditions. Conduct a general overview. While obtaining a careful health history, choose areas to concentrate on during the local examination. Take specific measurements as indicated by the local examination. Inspection. A systemic inspection is done starting at the head and neck and moving to the upper extremities, lower extremities, and trunk. Regular use of a systemic approach is important to avoid missing important aspects of the examination. Inspect the skin for general color, scars, or other overt signs of previous injury or surgery. Certain skin lesions require <clears throat> further investigation because they can indicate underlying disorders. For example, butterfly rash over the cheeks and nose is characteristic of SLE. Note the patient's general posture and body build, muscle size and symmetry, and symmetry and contour of joints. Observe for any swelling, deformity, nodules or masses, and discrepancies in limb length or muscle size. Use the patient's opposite body part for comparison when you suspect an abnormality. If the patient can move independently, assess posture and gait by watching the patient walk, stand, and sit. Musculoskeletal and neurologic problems can result in abnormal gait patterns. Palpation. As with inspection, palpation usually proceeds head to toe. Examine the neck, shoulders, elbows, wrists, hands, back, hips, knees, ankles, and feet. Warm your hands to prevent muscle spasm, which can interfere with identifying essential landmarks or soft tissue structures. Carefully palpate any specific areas of concern because of subjective report of or abnormal appearance on inspection. Both superficial and deep palpation are usually done consecutively. Consider the underlying anatomy structures and landmarks you are palpating. Purposefully palpate both muscles and joints to evaluate skin temperature, local tenderness, swelling, and crepitation. Establish the relationship of adjacent structures. Evaluate the general contour, 
abnormal prominences in local landmarks. Note the specific anatomic location of any abnormal findings. Motion. When assessing the patient's joint mobility, carefully evaluate active and passive range of motion, ROM. ROM is the full movement potential of a joint. Measurements should be similar for active and passive maneuvers. Active ROM means the patient takes their own joints through all movements without assistance. Passive ROM occurs when someone else moves the patient's joints without their assistance through the full ROM. Be careful in performing passive ROM because of the risk for injury to underlying structures. Pain and resistance occurs, stop at once. If you know deficits in active or passive ROM, assess functional ROM to determine if joint changes are affecting the ability to perform ADLs. Ask the patient if activities such as eating, grooming, dressing, and bathing require help or cannot be done at all. We use a goniometer to accurately assess ROM. Measures the angle of the joint. We do not usually measure specific degree of ROM of all joints. If a specific musculoskeletal problem has been identified, measure ROM of the affected joint. A less exact but valuable assessment method is simply to compare the ROM of one extremity with that on the opposite side. Common movements that occur at the synovial joints, including abduction, adduction, flexion, and extension, are described. Tip 61.3. Muscle strength testing. Grade the strength of individual muscles or groups of muscles during contraction on a five-point scale. Grade normal muscle strength with full resistance to opposition as a five out of five bilaterally. To test resistance to opposition, have the patient apply resistance as you exert a force. For example, have the patient try to extend the elbow when you try to flex it. Compare muscle strength with the strength of the opposite extremity. Note any subtle variations in a muscle strength when comparing the patient's dominant and non-dominant sides. Variations in strength also exist when comparing people. Measurement. When limb length discrepancies or subjective problems are noted, measure limb length and circumferential muscle mass. For example, when gait disorders are observed, measure leg length between the antero superior iliac crest and the bottom of the medial malleolus then compare it with the similar measurement of the opposite extremity measure muscle mass circumferentially at the largest area of the muscle when recording measurements record the exact location in which the measurement was obtained e.g. the left quadriceps muscle was measured 15 centimeters above the patella this tells the next examiner the exact area to measure and ensures consistently uh, reassessment. Other. Note the patient's use of an assistive device such as a walker or cane. Assess the patient for proper fit while reviewing the safe and correct technique for using these devices. Regularly review with the patient the use of the assistive device to be sure it is still appropriate and safe. Ask the patient if the assistive device is used regularly, and not determine possible reasons for inconsistent use. Scoliosis. It's a lateral as shaped curvature of the thoracic and lumbar spine. Unequal shoulder and scapula head is usually noted when the patient is observed from the back. Ask the patient to place the hands together above the head as if diving into a swimming pool slowly bend forward at the waist, allowing assessment of thoracic rib prominence or paravertebral muscle prominence in the lumbar spine. Advanced scoliosis can impair lung and heart function. The straight leg raising test is done in, uh, on the supine patient with sciatica or leg pain. Passively raise the patient's leg 60 degrees or less. The test is positive if the patient reports pain along the distribution of the sciatic nerve. A positive test shows nerve root irritation from intervertebral disc prolapse and herniation, especially at level L4-5 or L5-S1. 
Assessment of reflex, discuss chapter 55, table 61.5 shows an example of how to record a normal physical assessment. Abnormal assessment findings of the musculoskeletal system are described in table 61.6. A focused assessment is used to evaluate previously identified musculoskeletal problems and to monitor for signs of new problems. See the focused assessment of the musculoskeletal system box. Diagnostic studies of musculoskeletal system. Many diagnostic studies are used to assess the musculoskeletal system. The use of studies such as x-rays, MRI, and bone scans has greatly improved orthopedic care. X-ray is the most common diagnostic study used to assess musculoskeletal problems and to monitor treatment effectiveness. Because bones are denser than other tissues and contain calcium, most x-rays are absorbed by the bone tissue and do not penetrate it. Dense areas show as white in the standard x-ray. X-rays provide information about bone deformity, joint congruity, bone density, and calcification in soft tissue. X-rays are useful for diagnosing fractures. They also help evaluate genetic developmental infectious inflammatory malignant metabolic and degenerative disorders. Aspirated synovial fluid is assessed for volume, color, clarity, viscosity, and mucin clot formation. Normal synovial fluid is transparent and colorless or straw colored. It should be scant in amount and low viscosity. Fluid from an infected joint may be purulent and thick or gray and thin. In gout, the fluid may be whitish yellow. Blood may be aspirated if there is a hemarthrosis due to injury or bleeding disorder. The mucin clot test indicates the character of the protein portion of the synovial fluid. Normally, a white rope-like mucin clot is formed. In the presence of inflammation, clot fragments easily. Fluid is examined grossly for floating fat globules, which indicate bone injury. In septic arthritis, protein content is increased and glucose is considerably decreased. The presence of uric acid crystals suggests a diagnosis of gout. A gram stain in culture also may be done to assess for the presence and type of infection.